So it's time for my what am I sowing and growing in December and January. And I just want to prefix this by saying that December is a really bad month for growing things and January is not a great month for growing things. So for most people, in most circumstances, for most types of plants, the best time to start is the middle of February. And you'll see what I'm going to grow in the middle of February in my video on in January. Uh, so I'll give you a month's notice. But there are some reasons why you might want to start growing things in December and January. Part of it is you might just be a bit like me and just really like have things growing and just enjoy the process of growing things and just watching them and just, you know, you know reveling in, in the wonder of nature. And the other one might be to do seedling trials, seedling um, germination trials. So that's what I've been doing here. And I should be doing lots of those through December where I'm just checking out my old seed packets and seeing how well they germinate. So you can see, for example, that these, uh, what are they? Winter gem lettuces, none of those germinated. So that seed packet, seed packet number 599, Need, not that one, so in the seed packet number 51, that one needs throwing away. Now, having germinated something like this, you might think, well, why not just give it a go and see how it grows? And I agree with that. I think if you've got an environment where you can grow them, a cold greenhouse, a cold polytunnel, or under grow lights, um, then you know, and if you're not using your grow lights for anything else, or you're not using your greenhouse or polytunnel for anything else, then try them out. What you'll get is something like this. Not the healthiest looking lettuces in the world, but not too bad. Those are about three weeks old, or something like this. These are like, again, little brassicas, uh, not looking again particularly healthy, but these are little calabrese. So these will be ready for planting out in sort of the middle of February, probably, um, and give you a nice early crop at the beginning of June or the end of, Ma of May, something like that. And these are little beetroot, and they will probably go to seed. So you'll only get baby beets and leaves out of them. But again, if you've got some space, then you could give them a go. Um, so basically, it comes down to you know, those sorts of scenarios. If you've got a bit of space and you want to fill it and you want to give it a go, why not give it a go? You're not, you're not going to lose anything. And, you know, if you've got old seed packets, but you don't want to wait because then you're taking a risk. Like if you start sowing your seeds in the middle of February and you find that they don't germinate and you wait two weeks to see if they'll germinate, then you've lost two weeks of harvest. So try that out in December and January. That's great. I'm doing the same with my peppers, for example, doing all the old seed packets of peppers, doing germination trials on those to see if any of them germinate. And I'll talk about that in the rest of the video. So first up are microgreens, lots of very popular microgreens. We don't grow very many of them because we have so much grown fresh in the ground to maturity. But um, peas, they're a pretty good microgreen to grow and they just grow on the kitchen windowsill and they're absolutely great. Uh, Second one on my list for December is Leela spring onions. This is just a space issue for me. So I will have loads of stuff growing in January and February. I just don't have enough space to germinate and grow on all the spring onions that I need. So I'm going to start some, my favourite variety, Leela. They don't overwinter very well, so it's good to start them now in winter so they'll get planted out in kind of, you know, very early March time, something like that. And of course, that's the time when I will be planting lettuces. So they'll probably get interplanted with those. Um, next up on the list are the three chili peppers. I'm only doing three chili peppers this year. We don't eat a huge number of chili peppers. Debbie likes the bigger ones. They're easier to process. So we're doing Hungarian hot wax and Anaheim and jalapeno. Just those three. I've got loads of old seeds from last year, so I'm just gonna do a germination test to see whether I can get them to germinate a little bit earlier. If I can, that's good, because it means I get to use grow light space for a month that wouldn't otherwise be being used. 
and then I'll take them out of the grow lights in about March time, probably the beginning of March, because it's, you know, after I've had 90 days of grow lights, they're kind of big enough to cope on their own on a very sunny windowsill. And in this conservatory, I do have a very sunny windowsill that I can put them on. And I find that, you know, I am a bit space constrained for growing things like tomatoes and peppers. Uh, but the nice thing about the chili peppers is they don't grow that big. So I can get, since I'm only going to grow, I think 12 of them in total, something like that. Um, I can get away with just you know, one small tray really for most of their lives and then just pot them on a little bit. Um, so that's them. And also the other benefit is I can grow those on in my mini greenhouse, which I can heat. That's the only heated space uh, I've got on the allotment <coughs> in addition to this uh, conservatory. So that's them. And next up on the list are the sweet peppers. Now I'm only going to do 12 of them. Now I do 48 sweet peppers plus a few spares normally. Um, and that's four lotals worth. I put 12 in each lotal. And what I find is that my early crop last year, which I sowed in January, I got a great crop off those in July. And then I got like a reasonable crop in August and September from the same plants. But I had loads of new, really nice big peppers uh, in October and I just couldn't quite get them all ripened. So I figured that what I want to do is at least just for my early crop is just bring those a little bit earlier, a month earlier effectively, uh, with a hope that I'll just have enough extra time then to get that huge sort of late crop ripened. And if I don't, then I don't. But I thought I'll give it a try. Now, obviously, these might not germinate at all, in which case I'll just do my February sowing and you'll see that in a minute. I'm also going to do the same with long red Marconi. So those are the two that I found were the best last year. In fact, the long yellow Ringo were really, really early and Debbie really liked those. So, um, yeah, the earlier I can get those, the better. Um, so the next one I'm going to try is I'm just going to try some of these elephant leeks. Now, an allotment neighbour of mine grew these and she grew them not actually this quite this early, but she started hers in January, I think. And then she gave them like a huge amount of chicken manure feed, which I thought would just send them to seed, you know, quite quickly. But actually they grew really big, so they're like this sort of big in August. So... I don't actually like leeks when they're that big, but obviously they were kind of that big in June. And so I figure that is just perfect. I'd be really keen if, that, if I could achieve that. And maybe they won't go to seed if, um, if you're harvesting them in June. So anyway, I'm going to give that a go. Start the in December. And again, I'll keep them under lights for about 45 days and I'll put them in the polytunnel. And they're frost hardy, so they should be okay there. Um, and if there's any really hard frost, I'll just pop them under a little bit of fleece. So we'll see how those go. I can afford to take a risk because I only interplant my leeks anyway, so I'm not actually using up kind of any space. Um, then I've found I've got quite a lot of tough ball seeds left over. Now I love tough ball sown in August. Uh, well, late July, I do two batches, late July and August, overwintered for a harvest in June. But what I found is that those tough ball that are harvested in June, they are actually keeping superbly well even now, uh, just in our unheated, well, it's minimally heated, I guess, garage. Um, and so they've been a real favourite. Now, I figured that if I'm going to grow any kind of the second batch of early onions, tough ball is the perfect one because they will start to bulb in... April, I think, the middle of April, because they're a 14 hour day onion. So when daylight hours reach 14 hours, they start to bulb. So you want them as big as you can get them by that time. Now with a main crop onion, they don't start bulbing until middle of May. So there's not a lot of point growing main crop onions really early, but these 14 day onions, there is a point growing them early because you know if you can get them to maturity effectively or get give them lots of green growth, by the middle of April, then they've got a lot of green growth there to support bulbing 
from the middle of April. Now, with your main crop onions, that's unlikely. Um, so, or you don't need it. <laughs> you don't need to do that with your main crop onions because they've got an extra month of growing. So I'm going to give those a try because otherwise those seeds, they won't be any good for next year. So I think if I get them started this year, maybe I've got an early crop. Now, yeah, and I don't have a lot of space for them, so I'm going to get interplanted. So I'll probably end up harvesting them when they're this sort of size. But still, that's really, we find that that sort of size of onion in spring is really popular. So that should be nice. And then I'll do some radish. Now, I've never done radish quite this early, but what I have found is if you sow the radishes in modules and put them, normally I put them in a 40 cell tray, so it's a really small cell. Um, but <clears throat> for these, I thought, well, if I put them in a 24 cell tray, then I can leave them for a bit longer. And so they'll actually start to form the radish at the time I plant them. And that will probably be in uh, late January, you know, or very early February, and I can kind of control the growth rate. <laughs> I can kind of control the growth rate by putting them somewhere cold, and so I could put them in my uh, polish lung, for example, unheated, and that'll just store them for a while, and they'll just sit there. And then by about the middle of February, they'll kind of kick off. But it means I've got a batch of radish as big as I can kind of get them for an early crop in March. And I do like to do that. I've never quite got them quite that early before. I got them like right the middle to the end of March. But I like that because by that time I'm starting to run out of ochre. And I use ochre for my winter radish. And obviously we have salads every day of the year. So I want to make sure that I've got some radish-like thing to put in my salad mixes uh, all year round. So I'm going to give that a go, see what happens and just more successions of uh, peas. So let's take a look at January. <coughs> oh yeah, wrong database. I need to be looking at next year's January. Okay, so first up, early January, are the chili peppers again now of course that's only because that first batch in december might not germinate if they don't germinate then obviously i'll sow these if they do i won't because i don't need that many chili peppers as i said i'm only growing 12 plants uh, to be honest you know we grew up quite a bit more than that this year and we were just overwhelmed with chili peppers we didn't know what to do with them um so the next thing on my list are swift potatoes now swift are our favorite early potato uh, people talk about them taking 75 days, but that's if you sow them in March, April time. They're going to take quite a bit longer than that. So I like to give them at least 90, maybe 100 days. But what, why I want these and why I'm starting them so early, so early in January, is because my new potatoes, I generally start to run out of those in early April. So in order to get a nice continuous supply of new potatoes, I need to start them in January. And I say, Swift do the best. Now, the way that I do these potatoes, I've got a whole guide to how to grow potatoes. Well, I've got guides to how to grow most things in my ebook, and you can find a link to that in the description below. But I do just start, I chip them obviously as early as possible, and then I'll start them in small pots, and I'll grow those pots in behind the kind of not under the grow lights but in the kind of overspill lighting from the grow lights and they're just fine there and grow into nice little plants and then i can transplant those plants into their final containers later on so they probably end up going into their containers in sort of february and then they still kind of stay in this conservatory until sort of mid to late february and they go into the polytunnel or the mini greenhouse and they'll kind of not live under fleece. They'll be only have fleece if there's going to be a chance of frost. Um, and generally, I managed to keep them alive. Last year, I did lose two plants out of about, about 20 or something like that, but uh, not so bad. Now, I do recommend that you only sow the minimum number of potatoes at this time of year um, in January. You really don't want to put in, you know, like 10 containers or something like that because you only want to sow the number that you can eat. 
in a week or for two weeks. We generally do them every two weeks just because it's easier. So we sow two weeks supply of potatoes every two weeks for you know the next few months until we're ready to start sowing our main crop. And, and at, you know, our first early, traditional first early, second early is the main crop. So these are what we consider our sort of super early potatoes. Then I'll do some another batch of sweet peppers and I will probably do these regardless of whether the first batch succeeded or not uh, but I'm only doing again a relatively small number so I'm only going to do another quarter of them so another 12 and then I'll do my main crop sowing kind of the beginning of February but that will mean that I've already got 24 plants that are going to be nice and early so that'd be pretty good and when I do my main crop I'll probably sow the full 48 just in case these ones that I do early don't look so healthy in a couple of months time and then I can just either give those away or um, scrap them. So that's what I'm doing with the peppers and yeah I think as I say most of the, my consideration about peppers is I need to keep them above 10 degrees centigrade and I need to keep them in an environment with really high light levels. And that means they've got to really be in this conservatory because it's the only place that meets those two requirements early on in February and March. And I just don't have space for too many. So yeah, that's the way I just have to figure out ways around that. So then I'll do a batch of lettuce and these lettuce will go under a low tunnel. And the reason that I do a batch of lettuce now is because I really like these particular varieties of lettuce in the spring. And so I'm doing Grenoble Red, Canasta, Ricky, and yeah, and Navarro. So, yeah, they're just favourite varieties and we'll see how they get on. Uh, they generally do pretty well and I'll interplant them with something, probably radishes or spring onions or turnips or something like that. So, speaking of radishes and turnips, so I'll do another batch on 7th of January or thereabouts. I'm not that uh, bothered about the exact date. And I'm gen this year I'm just doing the cherry type of um, radish. So I used to do a whole range of different ones, but everybody just seems to really like Cherry Bell and Scarlet Globe. So I'm just going to do those two, and I'll just do you know, half a tray of those and half a tray of turnips twice a month. And uh, yeah, they should be pretty good. I, I mean, I, I know fr from past experience that both turnips and radishes do fine sown in early January, provided you've got some grow lights. Otherwise, you know, I think it's just better to wait until February. Uh, they will get planted out in low tunnels and coal frames, and they generally get interplanted into things like the spinach beds and the lettuce beds, uh, and they do pretty well there, and they don't seem to interfere with those other plants at all. Later sowings of, of turnips, you just have to be a little bit careful with them because if you can't grow them fast, and so if you're growing them in a cold environment, you know, like just under fleece or something like that, then it's pretty likely they won't mature before they go to seed. So you'll get turnip greens and you might get little tiny turnips like that, but you won't get a, a decent crop off them before they go to seed. But this early sowing, I've always managed to get these before they go to seed. And then for your kind of main crop you start them a bit later and then they don't go to seed so sort of you know the, the trouble is that april time is their natural time to go to seed so if you sow them a bit too close to that that's just what they do so then we're on to early kales now we love kales and we a huge amount basically i have kale pretty much every day um and the problem is with kale that by kind of april may time it's all going to seed. It's just its natural time. You can't really do anything about it other than starting some kale really early. So again, start that in January. Again, it's really got to go under grow lights. Um, and 
the beauty of that is that by May, effectively, this is now ready for harvest. This new crop is now ready for harvest. So just as one crop's finishing, the new crop's ready. But you do have to treat these early kales, and I'm doing Nero Black Magic and Dwarf Green Curly Kale. You do have to treat them as a kind of temporary crop. They will probably go to seed on you in sort of July, August time, sometimes even a little bit earlier than that. Um, so I'm, I really am just growing them for that period uh, of sort of May through to kind of the end of June. Uh, but they're still really valuable during that period. Uh, and then obviously I'll put something else in. I'll probably put something like uh, purple sprouting broccoli in after them. And although it's a brassica, I'm quite happy to have a brassica following a brassica uh, in that sort of scenario. So then just more successions of swift. As I said, I'm doing them every two weeks, uh, roughly speaking. So then another, my first succession of charlottes. Now, what we found with charlottes is that if you give them 120 days and you start them now, uh, not now, in, Janu in the middle of January, and you put them kind of behind me here, not under grow lights, but in the kind of overspill from the grow lights, they grow huge. So they grow about six feet tall. So you have to put canes in, put a bit of string in to keep them on the canes. Um, so you get these huge... Uh, potato plants so they look really nice in the, in the conservatory so you know we like them just as an ornamental and they're growing so big obviously because the light levels are low and last year when I did this I thought well I'm just going to get anything because all the energy has been put into top growth but actually we got really lovely main crop size potatoes uh, at the end of May now w generally we are running out of main crop potatoes from the store you know, in, in the sort of beginning of May. And so that means we get a, a fairly good continuity again of main crop potatoes. And we find that Charlotte's are great for that because they're a fast grower, but they do make a lovely main crop potato, even though they are second early, but they're, you know, they're nice general purpose baking potato size if you leave them for the full kind of 120 days. Again, the similar sort of story applies, only do as many as you need for say two weeks. So that's, in our case, that's just one container. And we might do three containers in here and that'll last us six weeks, but we'll do them every, you know, we'll plant them every two weeks. Because the later you plant them, the more natural sunlight they're getting, the less they depend on the grow lights. And um, you know, just the, the better they do and the bigger they are. So that's how we do our early, really early kind of main crop potatoes. Now what we also do, we'll do it a bit later, sort of the beginning of March, is we'll do some, again, Charlotte's or Estimo or something like that, similar sort of second early potato. But we'll do those under a cold frame um, and because, because natural light levels are quite high in April. But that means we get, again, a nice early main crop potato in about the beginning of June really uh, or you know through to the beginning of July and those last us all the way through until we've got our true kind of early main crops in about August time so that you know that's how we do it we've got a guide to growing potatoes all year round and I'll link that in the description below so I'll do my first just strictly speaking it's my second sort of you know early sowing of beetroot uh, but the first one is probably only for leaves and little baby beets. This one um, will go in the polytunnel and you need to give that as much light as you can. So it needs to go kind of in the sunniest spot in the polytunnel and you don't want to plant them too close together and you don't, I almost always interplant things, but with these you don't want to interplant them because you're trying to get them as fast as possible. You really, you know, in my case, I want these ready in about the beginning of May and I don't want them to go to seed so I want to make sure they're kept well watered there's no stress on them so I will sort of fleece them uh, if I need to um, but they generally do okay and in my experience I perhaps lose about 10% that go to seed but of course you can still use the leaves and to be honest we've actually eaten quite a few beetroot that have gone to seed if the if the roots have grown big enough they're often still okay uh, even when they go to seed. Obviously the thing is 
that when they do go to seed, they won't do any more root development. So at that point, once they've started going to seed, there's no real point leaving them in the ground and waiting for them to get bigger. They won't get any bigger. But if they're big enough already, like golf ball size or whatever, then pick them and eat them. They're just fine. Ah, oh, so what's next on my list? Right. So then just loads and loads of things that I've already probably talked about in multiple successions. So I'll start with my normal sort of memento of momentum rather, uh, just doing lots of radishes, uh, turnips and salad onions. And generally I do two sessions of those every week. For most of the year, I don't do them in uh, sort of June, July, because I don't really like radish in June, July. Well, in July. And uh, spring onions, I find they just don't do very well sown in June. But I will start sowing them again in July. So, you know, we've got pretty much everything covered. And I'll do my first succession of spinach. Now, our favourite spring spinach is um, Red Kitten. And so I'll start that kind of towards the end of January. And so I want that in the ground in March. And we'll start eating that in sort of late April time. And that is just when my overwintered spinach is starting to go to seed. So I get, again, a nice continuity because we like spinach every day of the year. We do have a guide to growing spinach every day of the year as well. Look in the description. Um, <clears throat> more turnips. Yeah, more spring onions. And then my first batch of main crop onions towards the end of January. So I'm going to start my Red Baron and my Zebrun. There's a brun are an onion, although they look a bit like a shallot. Um, so I'll start those. And I'm only going to do two trays because these are just the early crop. And again, it's part, kind of a space thing. I just want to keep things going in January just so I can use up the space I've got in January because everything gets really busy in February. Um, but I'll do most of my onions in February. And I'll certainly do most of my white onions in February because I've got all of those overwintered um, shenshu yellows and tough balls so I'm not in a mad kind of rush to get lots of um, white onions I've got, I'll have loads of them in sort of May, June, July time um, whereas the red onions we don't really do very many overwintered red onions we might do a few sets but we won't do very many so that's that and then I'll do some more leeks for, again for kind of the earlier crop of leeks and I might, and I might not, do some more sprouts for leaves. We really love sprouts for leaves. Um, we find they're just an amazing early crop, and they come about May uh, from ones that I started sort of back in October. And if you kind of use a fast-growing variety like Long Island Improved, and you do those in January, again, you'll probably get them like the middle of May, something like that. And you get loads and loads of leaves if you plant them really close together. You won't get that many sprouts. Um, but then if you leave them until sort of July time, and then you take the tops off them, so the sprout tops are like a little cabbage and they're gorgeous, uh, then you will probably get some sprouts developing on the stem and then you can take those out and I will probably follow those again with purple sprouting broccoli. So it's a nice kind of brassica continuity uh, in that bed and then the next year I won't put brassicas in that bed but it's, you know, for the whole year basically the bed's got brassicas and that means that the bed is nicely adapted to brassicas so it means that the... the Brassicas don't really have a relationship with mycorrhizal fungi, but they do have relationships with other sorts of fungi and bacteria in the soil. So the, the soil kind of gets adapted by that early crop of kale and um, Brussels sprouts. And then that's cleared, as I say, in July. And then the purple sprouting broccoli kind of takes advantage of a bed that's been adapted for brassicas. I find it works nicely. I don't get any disease issues. Or I haven't for the last six years. Who knows, might get it this year. And then I'll do my first sowing of Oregon sugar pod peas. We find these come first because obviously they're a March 2 pea and they don't need to develop the actual pea. Um, I like to just have these at the, si but at the same time, have my early strawberries. So sometimes sort of late April, early May time. And so I have to grow those under cover, put them in a little low tunnel if I can find the space or a container in the poly tunnel if I can't. 
I don't exactly know at this point exactly where everything's going because a lot of it depends on how things perform over winter. I mean, I might lose stuff over winter if we have like a really terrible frost or something, uh, in which case, you know, I just juggle my plans around. So I'm basically at this point sort of growing. My sowing philosophy is sow the stuff I want to eat and find places to plant it later and have a broad brush idea of what I'm sowing. Um, and I will share with you my plans for all of the different growing locations. So the front garden, the back garden, my allotment and Debbie's allotment. And those plans are quite nice. They do show all the variety names and all of the successions that I'm sowing. And I have two versions of those plans. They, they come exactly from the same data, so I don't have to do two lots of work. Um, but the variety one is quite useful, obviously, if you want to kind of figure out which varieties I sow and maybe try some of the same ones. Um, but the photo version of the plan is really nice because you can see kind of at a glance, you know, where all the lettuces are, where all the beetroot are and things like that. And it's just really nice. I find it being a very visual person um, much easier to kind of look at the photo version of the plan and the photo sort of successions for each bed than I do to look at all the names because I get a bit word blind really when I see just like a sea of names in front of me. So I think that is pretty much it. That was a bit of a marathon. But anyway, that's what I'm going to do in December and January. But as I said, I do kind of caution you if, you know, like money is tight or you don't have much time or you kind of, you know, you, you'd be upset if things fail, those sorts of things, you know, don't just don't do it. Wait until February. Then you're kind of guaranteed that everything will go right uh, for these sorts of crops. Um, and maybe even March if you haven't got grow lights for some things. So, you know, just take your time. But if you like to experiment and you don't mind things failing because you've got lots of contingency, whatever it is, and you've got spare seeds because so you don't worry about the financial aspect of it and you don't mind having grow lights on because you need the grow lights because you get seasonal, seasonal effect in this disorder and you're like looking, you know, working in a like, nice bright environment like I do. When all those things are true, there's just plenty of opportunity to have loads of fun and, you know, play lots of games and experiment over January and February. So my name's Steve. This is the Seaside Kitchen Garden Allotment Channel and I'll see you soon.